Friends, this is a day the Lord has made. So let us rejoice and be glad. And again, this is a day the Lord has made. So let us rejoice and be glad in it. It is truly a delight to see each and every one of you as we gather for worship this day. And we pray that this is an opportunity always that opens our hearts and minds to hear the incredible grace of God who loves us more than we could ever possibly ask or imagine. We wish to welcome you. My name is Pastor Wesley, and I have the joy and the privilege of serving with Pastor Mark. We are delighted to be in this place and delighted to be servants of this congregation. And so for all of you who are gathered here this morning and for those of you who are joining us online, we also wish to extend our warmest welcome to you. We pray that you let us know that you're here. You can either scan the QR codes on the front of the bulletin or you can go to the link that's in the description box on YouTube or to our website, umcnl.com slash here. Always let us know that you're worshiping with us so that we have an opportunity to reach back out to you in service and in love. But as we gather this morning, it's an opportunity for us always to welcome one another in Christian faith and life by passing the peace and extending our warmest welcome to one another. And so I invite you to pass the peace at this time. As we begin our time of worship, let us do so with prayer. Would you join me in the opening prayer found on the screen and in your bulletin? Almighty and everlasting God, in whom we live and move and have our being, you created us for yourself so that our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. Grant to us such piety of heart and strength of purpose that no selfish passion may hinder us from knowing your will and no weakness from doing it. In your light, may we see life clearly, and in your service, find perfect freedom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Our opening hymn today is Come Thou Font of Every Blessing, 400 in the hymnal or on the screen. may be seated. What, what did I say? Font. I, font. I said font, yes. like Comic Sans? Yes. Okay. Times New, Times New Roman. Okay, good. Um, that was wrong. I apologize to all the literary people out there. May you forgive me and have grace. I want to take a moment uh, for our kids, hey kids, uh, who are here, hey kids, who are, uh, you lost your opportunity to come forward, so just listen from there, thank you. <clears throat> Welcome all the kids who are online, so good to have you here. Uh, I brought something special with me today, except, uh, where did I, I brought my stole, I stole, 
It's a very special stole. Someone from the church made this for me. It was a gift. They devoted their time. It took time to make this. They devoted their talents. I don't know. I'm not very good at making things like this. She has the talent to make this and a lot more fancy things I've seen. And also her treasures. It took a little bit of money to do that. She devoted her time as a special gift. And I really, really appreciate that. But this stole is also a symbol of devotion. This stole is a symbol of Pastor Wesley and I's clergy order, of which there are several in the United Methodist Church. We are a member of the Order of Elders, and that means we have devoted our entire life and our vocation and where we go to the church, to the United Methodist Church here in Northern Illinois. Now, Pastor Wesley is going to be talking about devotion, so hopefully that maybe is a word that you might have just learned a little bit more about. To be devoted to something means that you spend your time with it, that you are interested in it, that you love it, that your talents are used for it, that even your money, your treasures are used for it. And so we're called to be devoted to the church. But how can we do that? And you may be saying, well, how, how can I do that? I'm just a kid or I'm just an adult or I'm 150 years old. How can I do that? Well, don't worry, if you're here or watching online, you already passed the devotion test. Because as we're going to learn, the early church devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the community, to shared meals, and to prayer. And every Sunday when we get together, we spend some time devoted to God because, or, or through the apostles' teaching, through our community, through prayer, and sometimes through a shared meal we call communion. So I encourage you, how can you be devoted to God and to the church? There are little things we can do every day and big things we can do together, and that's why we are a church. Would you pray with me, kids? Dear God, thank you for being devoted to us. Help us devote ourselves to you. Help us devote our time, our talents, and our treasures to your kingdom. We love you. Amen. Thanks, kids.
Beautiful, thank you. As much as I uh, miss our big groups, uh, join us in music. It's a pleasure over the summer to uh, have our very talented musicians uh, share music with us and uh, share very appropriate words uh, as we uh, continue to talk about devotion today. As we move into uh, prayer time and praying for others' intercession, I want to remind you that your pastors are here for you. We'll continue to say that uh, every week, and hopefully uh, you'll, you'll get it, uh, that we do truly care for you, and we are here for you, not just when you have you know, issues of, of mind and body and emotion. We are here for you for those things, but we are your pastors and our primary skill, our primary talents, and our primary concern is your spiritual well-being. And so if you have questions of spirit, if you have feelings of anxiety and things that are going on in the world and, and you need to understand or challenge yourself how to grow in love despite everything that's happening, we're here for you. We're happy to listen. We're happy to talk. We're happy just to live with you in these moments. So as we come to this prayer, I just ask that you center yourselves, take a breath, forget everything else that's happening. We are here to worship God, and through that we can be moved and challenged and transformed. We'll have a moment of silence, I'll have a short prayer, and then we will pray together the Lord's Prayer. Let us take a breath, enter an attitude of peace and prayer as we come to God. Lord, today we have gathered as a congregation of disciples to worship you. By your Spirit, enable us to devote ourselves fully to you. We know that when we truly live out our calling to be your disciples, that wonders and signs happen in our midst. As we come to you in prayer this morning, we bring all our burdens and concerns. Each of us has our own struggles, and we need your guidance, strength, and love. We also share the concern that we have for the needs of our community, our nation, our world, and all of your good creation. As you hear our prayers today, Lord, help us hear you calling us into action. Bless us with the gladness of that early church. Remind us that such a gladness that they had comes through simplicity generosity, and devotion to you. We pray this in your holy and blessed name and pray the prayer your Son Jesus Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 46, from the Common English Bible translation. The believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the community, to their shared meals, and to their prayers. A sense of awe came over everyone. God performed many wonders and signs through the apostles. All believers were united and shared everything. They would sell pieces of property and possessions and distribute the proceeds to everyone who needed them. Every day, they met together in the temple. They ate together in their homes. They shared food with gladness and simplicity. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Friends, let us be in the spirit of prayer, shall we? Lord, would you open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may hear with joy what it is that you would say to us this day. And ultimately, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each and every one of our hearts truly be acceptable in your sight, Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen.
morning, we're going to talk about the church and specifically talk about what it means to live into the vision of how the church is called to be and what we're called to be, what we're, what we're going to look for. And I'm going, to, I'm going to share with you my vision of the church. But before I do that, there's always a couple of disclaimers that must be, that must be said. Number one is we're not going to cover everything. We're not going to answer every question. We're not going to cover every detail. But the idea is to open our hearts and minds to what it is that God will be calling our community of faith to look like and how it is that we would be shaped. But how that is shaped is always dependent on every single one of us participating in the reality of God's unbelievable presence. And so the joy of gathering here today is to recognize that part of what we're called to do is to be devoted, as the earlier disciples were, to what to what enveloped or what developed into the beauty that we call the church. Are you ready? This is a passage of Scripture that Mark claims is on his list of this top 100 passages, which I think is an absolutely appropriate text to be on the top 100. And I've also told Mark that, you know, it's tough for me to come up with only 100 passages because I like the whole thing. There are parts he's not fond of, and I understand that. There are parts that are a little difficult, but someday you too shall understand. I love my colleague, don't get me right, I do love you, Mark, I love to tease. A part of the vision of the early church is is found in this chapter of Acts. Acts is really the story of of the church as it began to grow and as it spread to the then known world. And the vision of what the early church looked like had four particular marks of what the, of what the uh, people, what the members of the church, the, the community, were devoted to. And so we're going to take each one of those in turn. So if you're the kind of person that loves logic and order in a sermon with specific points that you can monitor so that you know exactly how long the sermon is going to be before you get lunch, then this is the sermon for you. Point number one, the apostles were devoted, the the people, the church, they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. So this is just kind of one of the pop quizzes. What is the apostles' teaching in the early church? What was it? What? Christ is risen. That's part of the teaching, yes. Any other ideas? What else is the teaching of the other? What are the apostles' teachings? Love God. Love your neighbor. In fact, the apostles' teachings eventually become what we know as the the New Testament. In other words, the apostles' teaching are what arise into the Scripture. The Scripture wasn't written to give rise to the faith. Our faith is, is firmly rooted not just in a bunch of stories, but in an event. And the event that grounds our faith is the resurrection. It is the resurrection, it's the Easter narrative that defines who we are as Christianity. And thus, because of resurrection, which we talked about back on Easter, it's because of resurrection that ultimately everything about who Jesus is and how we understand Jesus as God incarnate, the God of the universe who dares to become part of us, one of us, the one who literally lives out human existence within our broken, sin-filled, and alienated humanity, Jesus gets us, lives our life, and ultimately takes our life and redeems it into the very high and holy presence of God. The beauty of the resurrection is what calls to mind for all of the apostles everything about his birth, his life, his his teachings, his ministry, and ultimately his death and resurrection. And the resurrection becomes the event that is the catalyst for the church. It's not the stories that define the faith, it's the event that describes our faith. And so many times the analogy that I like to draw is if somebody has a child and you were to go to the hospital, what is it you're there to see? The birth certificate? No. What are you there to see? The child, the baby. In fact, the event of the birth of the child is the reason why the birth certificate exists. Make sense? So you don't go to see the baptismal certificate. You didn't create a baptism. Uh, I'm sorry, not a baptismal, a birth certificate. Baptismal certificate is what we give out. <laughs> and if you don't have one, you're always welcome to talk to us. Pastor Mark and I, we'd love to talk about your spiritual life. That's what we do. But you don't go to the hospital to see a birth certificate. You don't write a birth certificate in order eventually to have a child. You, you are having a child, which is what the birth certificate gives witness to. Make sense? The same, I think, is true with the Scripture. 
The event of the faith is what gives rise to the witness of the event, and the witness of that event is what eventually is the New Testament. In other words, when the, uh, when the early church would gather together, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and we too always have an opportunity to be devoted to the apostles' teaching. For us, we have the gift of the text that records the experiences and the witness of the people who lived there, the people in the New Testament who knew Jesus or who knew the people who knew Jesus. That's how close those events are written. So we're devoted to the apostles' teaching, which is why we spend, and we advocate, we spend time devoting ourselves to the reading of Scripture, the Scripture that we love and that's familiar, and yes, sometimes even the Scripture with which we wrestle and that we may even disagree with. But we're called to live in that space of opening our hearts and minds to the apostles' teaching. Are we devoted, as the early church, are we devoted to the apostles' teaching? Point number two is this, that the apostles, uh, that the church devoted itself to the community. They devoted themselves to the church. They would come together and devote themselves to the context of being together in community. I always think of this like anything that's a group of people. Like when I was growing up, I played the bassoon. And the bassoon looks like a lampstand. It has about six notes that sound good. The rest are on the verge of sounding completely ridiculous. It's true. If you ever hear a bassoon solo, chances are statistically high that you're watching a cartoon. The bassoon is the clown of the orchestra. They sit kind of in the middle of the orchestra, and you can't identify it. But what it does is it often adds to the coloration of the ensemble. It's not a solo instrument. I mean, it can be a solo instrument, but often it's kind of a funny sounding, it's the clown of the orchestra. That's why I played it. <laughs> Don't agree too fast. <laughs> but the bassoon is a part of a larger band. It doesn't play the same notes as everybody else. It's a part of the larger orchestra. It doesn't play the same notes as everybody else. It has a specific purpose. It has a specific colorations. It often has notes that are dissonant with the rest of the ensemble, but that doesn't mean that I just pack up my case and go home because the trumpets weren't playing the same notes as I was. Like, that's not the concept of it. The concept is, among all of the various beautiful gifts of music, all of the instruments work together to create something beautiful. Or, as Pastor Mark mentioned, our ensembles during the year when we have our choirs or our bells, every single part is vital to the beautiful music that they produce. Sometimes the music is beautiful and harmonious, at other times it can come across as dissonant, but part of the dissonance is what leads to something that is magnificent when put together. Or, let me translate this to something that some of you may understand, a sports ball. If you play sports ball, any kind of sports ball, uh, if you're on a team, do you not have to participate in everything that happens in order to make the team the best possible team imaginable? So, in other words, every position is, is a necessity. Not everybody can play the same position on a soccer field. Not everybody can play the same position on a football field. Not everybody plays the same position on a basketball court, correct? You don't always agree with the other members of your team. Sometimes there's dissonance with the, with the team. Sometimes you need, to, you need to focus on things that aren't comfortable or that, are really, that really cause you to wrestle. But, but all of that contributes to adding to the health of the team if the team works together. Because nobody on a team functions as a solo artist. So I came upon that. I thought this was, this was kind of funny. This, I stumbled upon that. I don't know who originally authored it, but I thought it, it really resonated with me. And I thought, well, there might be a connection to worship. You know, there are 12 reasons that I stopped going to sporting events. The coach never came to visit me. Every time I went, they asked for money. The people in my row didn't seem very friendly. The seats were very hard. The referees made decisions I didn't agree with. I was sitting with hypocrites. They only came to see what others were wearing. Some games went into overtime, and I was late getting home. N not when I preach. The band played songs I had never heard before. The games are sometimes scheduled on days that are my only days to sleep in and run errands. 
My parents took me to too many games when I was growing up. I once read a book on sports, and I feel I know more than the coaches anyway. Or I don't want to take my children because I want them to choose for themselves what sport they like best. <laughs> Tongue in cheek, but there could be a connection to the devotion that we have toward community. The devotion we have towards community, I often think of as a covenantal relationship. That's what we have. Those of you who have joined the membership of the church, we have a covenantal relationship with the church. Pastor Mark and I, once we were ordained, we took vows. We have a covenantal relationship with the church. And when I think of a covenant, it's not a contract. A contract exists so far as we both fill our agreement in the contract, but a covenant is deeper than a contract. This is from a book called The Relational Way. It's by Scott Boren, and he writes this, Covenant means that I commit to you with the full knowledge that you will let me down and that we will fail one another. Through covenant relationships, we learn to love people through differences through failures, through misunderstandings, and even judgments. We discover what Jesus meant when He told His disciples that the key to their discipleship was loving one another. To covenant with others also means that I choose to embrace people who are not like me. Jesus gathered a small group that was comprised of people who were very different. These men possessed no natural inclinations toward connecting with one another as friends except for the fact that Jesus called them. He did not force them into a relationship with one another, but He did invite them into something that was different than self-sorting. That's what it is to be in a covenantal relationship and thus part of the vision of the church. So, point two is, are we devoted to the community? Point three is, is that the, that the early church devoted themselves to the sharing of meals. Sharing of meals happens all the time. In fact, when we read through the Gospels, we see all kinds of moments when Jesus would share meals with people, and quite candidly, that's where all of the miracles take place. I mean, the very first miracle that Jesus performs is when He and the disciples are invited to a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And at that wedding, Jesus' mom comes up to Him and, remind, and is kind of, I imagine, I read into this, she's in a little bit of a panic because they've run out of wine. So he says, fill up these large jars, some containing up to 20 or 30 gallons of water. And what does Jesus do? He turns the water into wine. A miracle happens. In other words, it is a gargantuan party. I love that story. You know, when Jesus is on the seashore and there are 5,000 people gathered, Jesus has compassion on them. So he takes a few loaves and a couple of fish, and what does he do? He blesses them, and they multiply, and that feeds, that feeds the multitude. In other words, around the table, a miracle happens. There's a couple of chapters later where, again, he takes a few fish and a few loaves of bread, and blesses them, breaks them, passes them out, and ultimately there's a miracle, a feeding of the 4,000. Yeah, there's a 5,000 and a 4,000 feeding, two almost back-to-back. At the Last Supper, Jesus also participates in something miraculous when He participates by gathering people together and ultimately establishing what we would now celebrate or participate in, the sacrament of Holy Communion. After the resurrection, Jesus had a miraculous catch of fish, baked fish and bread for the disciples, 153 fish, remember. It's a beautiful gift of, of meals where miracles Happen. Miracles happen for us when we gather around the table, when we have genuine conversations. It's why Pastor Mark and I, we, we love to see you in our office. That, that's always fun. But you know when we really get to have fun conversations? Is around a meal at a table. It's over a cup of coffee. It's those moments when we break from the standards and when we appreciate something outside of the walls of the church because the church gathers and miracles happen around the table. It's interesting, and this is just a totally random side note, one of these observations. Every time my wife and I go out to eat, what we discover is that we'll watch other tables, and, and families will come and sit down, and they'll pull out magic rectangles, and all of their heads will go down into their magic rectangles. And I'm not, that's not the sharing, that's not where miracles happen. 
You know what happens is when we lay aside our magic rectangles for just a moment and actually live into this call, into this beautiful gift of looking at one another face to face and having deep conversations about how it is with our soul, that's when miracles happen. Miracles happen around the table. This is, this is why the table always has a front and center prominent place. Many times we call this the altar. But when we're always celebrating the sacrament of Holy Communion, please note, we never stand in front of the altar. Where do we stand? We stand behind it because in the sacrament of communion, it's not an altar. It's a table to which everyone is invited and miracles happen. But this was first established at the Last Supper, the, the night on which he was betrayed, when Jesus gathered together with his disciples. But if you look around the table of the disciples, those disciples were people who would never, ever have gotten together on their own. You had people like James and John, who were brothers, bickering about which one was better than the other. Who's greater in the kingdom of God? Their mom was asking them if, if Jesus would put them at, at his right and his left seat in the kingdom. Peter was squabbling over the fact that he was number one in the list of the apostles, and yet at the Last Supper, I think he takes the position of lowest honor in order that Jesus would invite him up because he's just that special. You have Simon the Zealot and Matthew or Levi, the tax collector. And let me share, you would never, ever find a zealot and a tax collector sitting at the same table with one another. It, it, do I have your permission to go on on thin ice for just a second? If you have Simon the Zealot and Matthew the tax collector at the same table, that would be like having Chuck Schumer and Mitch McConnell at the same table. It'd be like having Kevin McCarthy and Nancy Pelosi at the same table. How easily do you envision that happening? Sharing a meal and life together except for one fact. It wasn't about their individual political ideologies. It was about the author of the universe who invited them to the table. And for many of us, it is easy to get hooked into and swallowed by, consumed by the things that agitate and irritate us and cause us to label and cast dispersions and anger upon other people. And that is not the table where Jesus invites his disciples. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. God is love which is why the two commandments of Jesus are to love God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself, which is why most of the squabbles that we end up having and most of the fights we end up having, right though we are, are often of no eternal consequence. That on the other side of eternity, most of the things about which we really fight one another have no eternal consequence. And here's the thing, when we gather around the table, it doesn't take a whole lot of people to start finding disagreements. I live with one human being, and do you think I agree with her all the time? Yes, a hundred percent. I've learned the phrase, yes, dear. And now you've heard a pastor lie in church in the middle of the sermon. The truth is we don't always agree. We're not designed to agree. All of us are designed as unique and beautiful individuals, people who are blessed of God to be who God calls you to be. But part of what creates a genuine table of faith is that we wrestle with one another and we listen to each other's stories. That's why the early church gathered around the table. That's why they shared food with gladness and sincerity and with simplicity. It's because they recognized that was the place where miracles could happen, but only if we're willing to participate in the totality of the New Testament, like consider others better than yourself, like let your love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. And if we listen to all of the admonitions of the New Testament that talk about the fruits of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the incredible gift of what the church could be, and it would be truly miraculous, wouldn't it? When it comes to the devotion of the early church, they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, they were devoted to the, the, to the community, and third, they were devoted to the shared meals. To what are you devoted? 
Point four, almost lunchtime. They devoted themselves to prayer. They earnestly prayed. And it, just, it wasn't just a laundry list of the things they wanted God to deal with for them, although that's perfectly acceptable prayer. It starts with saying, God, this is what's on my heart. And do you think God wants to hear what's on your heart? The answer to that is unequivocally, yes, God wants to know what's on your heart. Why? Because it's a relationship with the author of the universe. God desperately wants a relationship with each of us. That's what prayer is. It's a conversation, which sometimes means we need to listen to what God may be saying to us as well. And often that's borne out in the context of community, that part of what prayer is is to be borne out in the context of life together, not life individually, but life together. And so sometimes it requires that our prayer life look like this. Help me let go of the burdens of my anger, my disappointment, my resentment, my irritation, that person who drives me nuts to the core of who I am, the one around whose throat I want to hold. I need to let go of that so that I can ultimately ask God to help me see from their perspective, help me understand, help me be willing to be humble enough to listen carefully to what they're saying and why they think the way they do. And ultimately, one of the prayers that I have all the time is, help me see them through your eyes, O oh God. Because at the core of my theology, I genuinely believe, and maybe you've heard this, I genuinely believe that God loves you and there's nothing you can do about it. And if that's true, if God loves me that way, God loves everybody that way, for God so loved the world. So if that's true, I want to see through God's eyes. I want to see you through the lens of Christ. I want to have the kind of love that Jesus expresses on the cross when he looks into the eyes of his murderers and says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's that's the love I want to have. I want to pray about how it is I can let go of any of the irritations, the things that drive me nuts. I want to pray that my life is a witness of, genuinely, of genuine love. It's why I frequently tell everyone in this congregation, I love you. I genuinely love you. Pastor Mark and I, we, we are so blessed to serve the best church on the face of the earth. We love you. We are devoted to this place. We love this church, and we are so honored and blessed to be serving here. And part of it isn't because we're a perfect church. <laughs> we're not. If you're looking for a perfect church, I want to bless you in that quest because I'm not sure it exists, mostly because churches are filled with a whole bunch of sinners. I'm not, I mean, you know, it's not just... But love is expressed in the context of community when we genuinely attempt to love each other, to see each other through God's eyes. So the early church caught on to that. They knew that they ought to be devoted to prayer. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching. They were devoted to the community. They were devoted to the shared meals. They were devoted to prayer. And the result, this passage continues, is that a sense of awe came over everyone that God performed many signs and wonders among them through the apostles, and all the believers were united, and they shared everything. They would sell pieces of property and possessions, distribute the proceeds to anyone who needed them, and every day they met together in the temple and ate in their homes. They shared food with gladness and simplicity. They praised God, and they demonstrated God's goodness to everyone. And the Lord added daily those who are being saved. If you've ever wondered what my vision of the church is, it's based in this beautiful vision of the early congregations, the early church. Why? Because that's what God can do here also. If we live into the vision of being wholly devoted, to what are you devoted? Let us pray. Eternal Father, none of this is easy. And every time the community of faith gets it right, there's always something that detracts or, or pulls away from it. And sometimes, even as we gather here, we feel a check in our spirit, this, 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 this thing we need to offer to you, this, 
this knot in our soul or in our psyche that needs to be released. Would you help us by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit to lay down our lives for you, to offer ourselves into your hands as we devote ourselves to one another and ultimately as we seek to love you and love our neighbor as we love ourselves? Would you remind us of the beautiful vision that you give to us and to this congregation as we seek to follow you in the matchless, precious, and holy name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, this morning we always have an opportunity to respond to God's grace by offering our gifts. Again, you know, kind of like sporting events, they always ask for money. But the gift of the church is that the church doesn't need your money. The church needs sold-out disciples for Jesus Christ. And disciples give because they replicate the very heart of God who so loved the world he gave his only son, the one who creates us and gives us life. We serve a giving and generous God, and therefore every time we exercise generosity, it's a participation in the reality of who God is. That's why we give our gifts. We exercise that muscle of generosity to replicate the heart and character of God. And so we shared last week, Pastor Mark shared that the VBS children a couple of weeks ago, over the course of the week, brought in change over $500. And I understand from Pastor Mark that last week this congregation tripled that so that the congregation has raised in total around $2,000. Now, we're not done asking for that. If you wanted to contribute in the VBS process and wanted to bless the Children's Hospital, you're more than welcome to do that. We will never turn you away. But we always ask that you take some moment to listen to some special music and consider to pray about the ways in which God may be exercising your spirit of generosity in this place. We give thanks to God for the gift of music, and thank you. Friends, let us join together in our prayer of dedication. God of grace and glory, we thank you that you judge us not by the perfection of our actions, but by our readiness to live boldly by faith. 
Help us as individuals and as a congregation to trust you and follow where you lead, that in Christ your name may be glorified in all the earth. Amen. Our hymn is number 430, O Master, Let Me Walk With Thee. As you're able, let us stand as we join in voice together. Friends, as we go from this place, know always that the living Lord will go with you, above you to watch over you, beneath you to lift you from grief and sorrow, beside you to befriend you, behind you to encourage you, before you to show you the way, and always within you to give you the gifts of faith, hope, and love. Dear friends, go forth always in grace and in peace, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.